All right. Well, welcome everyone. Um, we are very happy to have everyone here for the second in our series, our summer webinar series um, hosted by Clemson Extension School and Community Gardening and sponsored by South Carolina Farm to School. And this webinar is entitled Growing Volunteers in the School Garden. And even though schools are, um, are not open at the moment and our fate uh, of opening is a little shaky and filled with questions, um, we feel certain that when schools do go back in, whenever that is, that school gardens will, as always, be a huge part of getting kids back into the swing of learning, um, giving us outdoor opportunities to learn, and really expanding the classroom um, so we are just thrilled that Patricia was willing to come forward and lead this presentation. Um, so I just want to do a quick little introduction of who is with us today and what we're going to talk about. Um, I'm Amy Dabbs. I work for Clemson Extension as the School and Community Gardening Coordinator. Um, I just started in this role. I think this is my, November will be my second year and I love it. This is me. Um, uh, working with the Bee Cause Project down in Savannah, holding a handful of bees, which, which I was told later was not a smart move, but they were really sweet bees, so I'm fine with it. Um, also with us today is Megan Shearer, our School and Community Gardening Program Assistant, and you may have worked with Megan if you've worked with our school gardening program. Um, she is in charge of getting uh, gardens delivered, and I'll, which I'll tell you a little bit more about in a minute, um, and communicating with you throughout. And just as a reminder, um, we will offer, if you are a South Carolina licensed educator and you need renewal hours, like district level renewal hours, we will offer those. Um, we figured out this would be like a three hour um, renewal credit opportunity from Clemson Extension. So if you need those hours, just let us know. We'll send you a certificate at the end. Um, we do have attendee reports, so we just make sure you know that you were here for the bulk of the time. Also with us today is Ben Cease, the Farm to School Program Coordinator at the South Carolina Department of Education um, and longtime partner in crime with us here at Clemson Extension and we're grateful to him and to his department for funding um, this program um, today and the, the other ones that we've hosted in the summer. We'll have another one next month and um, he's gonna tell you more about what he does and he's gonna be one of our presenters today. Tracy Miss Kelly with South Carolina Farm Bureau, Ag in the Classroom, uh, could not join us today. She uh, really wanted to, but she sent her presentation, so I will be presenting that for her here in a few minutes, um, just a recording that she did, and you'll want to know uh, all about South Carolina Ag in the Classroom and everything that it offers if you are a classroom teacher or a volunteer in a school uh, garden situation because there are so many resources available through her programs. And then finally, last but not least, is our incredible presenter today, Patricia Whitener, who is the Greenville County 4-H Youth Development Agent. She is an amazing presenter. She's put a lot of thought and energy into today's um, presentation, but it, she comes at it with such exciting um, ideas and a lot of experience to back it up. Um, Patricia, I'm just going to tell you real quickly, has a um, Bachelor's of Science in Environmental and Natural Resources, a Master's Degree in Wildlife and Fisheries Biology, and she's now working on her PhD in Youth Development in the College of Behavioral, Social, and Health Sciences. Um, if you know Patricia, you know she leads a very successful 4-H program in um, Greenville County with an emphasis on personal leadership, growth and development, and STEAM-based learning. She has put a lot of energy into school gardens in Greenville County, and they have probably more school gardens than most other upstate um, counties. And she's done it all with the help of volunteers. So if anybody could help us um, grow volunteers in the school garden, it is Patricia. So we're so grateful to have her with us today. So, we try to follow an agenda. Uh, we'll try to stay on track. Um, if anything, we might be a little ahead of schedule um, instead of behind today. But just to let you know, we will take a break after uh, Tracy's presentation. Um, I've, I kind of glossed over Megan a little bit, um, telling us more about the um, about the um, the webinar setup. But I think you probably have figured out by now that you can chat in the chat box 
And then there is a Q and A um, function on this webinar and you can ask like content based questions there. And those panelists who are um, not speaking at the time will try to answer your questions. And if we can't, we'll hold them for the speaker at the end. So um, if anybody has, um, you know, any questions, that's the best way. That's the best thing to do is to chat over in the chat box. So real quickly, I want to tell you a little bit about, um, about what we do here um, with the school gardening program that we offer at Clemson Extension. And this is um, one of my favorite topics to talk about. So I'm very excited um, to have a, a captive audience today. Um, school gardening for South Carolina educators is um, a program that we started several years ago and we'll just, I'm just going to launch in. So we are part of Clemson Extension. Um, we are one third of the three prong mission of Clemson University's land grant charter of teaching, research, and community outreach or extension. Our role is to help improve the quality of life for all South Carolinians by providing unbiased research-based information through an array of public outreach programs. Um, our work really supports the $42 billion agriculture and forestry industries. We work to strengthen families and communities and to improve stewardship of natural resources in the environment. We work to strengthen the connections between people and their food and expose South Carolina youth to opportunities in agriculture, science, technology, engineering, and math. So that's kind of where school gardening for South Carolina educators comes in. Um, according to a um, 2015 study, um, there are about 60,000 jobs in the field of horticulture and agriculture that come open every year, but only 61% of them are filled by qualified graduates. Um, so it's our goal through our programs, um, particularly in the horticulture and 4-H areas, is to spark an early interest in these horticulture related careers. The crazy part about this is that the average American can only name about 10 plants. So think about that for just a minute. Um, yet we rely on plants for the oxygen that we breathe, for the food that we eat, the medicine, fiber, shelter, recreation, and beauty. Students, a lot of students and their parents are not aware of the myriad career opportunities available in the fields of horticulture, despite being regarded as a critical field and one that could literally save the planet. Fortunately, there is a lot of research about school gardening and how it can benefit students. School gardens help broaden children's experience of ecosystem complexity. It teaches students about food systems ecology, especially through vegetable gardens, and helps shape students' environmental values. And more importantly, school gardens improve student test scores and school behavior. But there's still a lot of boundaries to engaging students in school gardens. Um, so our team of extension agents looked at how we could take a holistic approach to training, creating, sustaining, and incorporating successful gardens that can be utilized as outdoor classrooms. So that's really where we started. We had a water cooler conversation a few, like maybe six or eight years ago where more than 50 calls had come into just one county office from educators who instinctively wanted to teach gardening to their students but weren't quite sure how to get started. And that's kind of where this whole thing um, began. So our first step was to create an online training resource for educators, parents, cafeteria, nutrition staff, administrators, and volunteers that would help build basic horticulture knowledge and skills necessary to grow food on school grounds because it's not as easy as it sounds. <laughs> the second was um, to model for educators and adults how to incorporate school gardening, gardening into STEM-based classroom instruction. That means that we got um, Patricia on board. She was one of our first 4-H um, agents to get involved in this program, and she's just been the linchpin to making school gardening for South Carolina educators work. She brought um, so much to the program, I don't know how, where we would be without her. So in every program that we offer now through the horticulture program, we always include a 4-H agent to come in and model a curriculum and get educators involved um, hands-on. So this is uh, from one of our hands-on workshops that we, that we offer. 
And then finally, we wanted, we thought about how we could provide real technical support for school gardens to free teachers and school communities up to address the issues like child obesity, childhood obesity and academic outcomes for their students. So we began by marshalling um, Clemson's network of resources, including master gardeners, 4-H agents, horticulture extension agents, and other volunteers. And then we started looking at our partners um, who are aligned with what, we, what we're doing. Um, and there's so many. And our, our partnership with Ben and the and Farm to School started. Um, we also partnered closely with MUSC um, Children's Health, the Boeing Center for Children's Wellness, which they will be joining us in August. And you can hear more about their programs and offerings and how they connect with us then. So across the state now, we've trained over 1,350 educators through this program. We have over 200 school gardens implemented and we're slowly creeping our way into every county in the state and we're now in 42 South Carolina counties. So this started with um, pilot program in 2012 um, with funding from Boeing and the College of Charleston. And now you can see how we've expanded out from just the Tri-County region here in Charleston. So our program, um, School Gardening for South Carolina Educators, is a five-week online training and hands-on workshop that is pre-approved for 20 renewal credits from the Department of Education. Um, it is, it is, uh, there is a cost associated, but we really try to give a price break for a team of teachers to take this, or not just even teachers, anybody from the school community. So parents, um, school nurses, librarians, whoever is in the school community who is supportive of a school garden is welcome to take the course. Included with the course are a K through eight um, South Carolina standards based garden STEM curriculum. And um, I'm sorry, I don't have a better picture that doesn't have microgreens on top of it, but you know, it was delicious. And then a seasonal planting guide and calendar that is more like a technical guide that helps. Um, guide educators in when and how to plant the vegetable crops in their school garden. So we really try to take all the guesswork out of the program. I can't say enough about the hands-on workshops and how um, integral they are to building skills, um, building relationships to support school gardening programs, and how to use the STEM curriculum in the outdoor classroom. When the 4-H agents, you know, come in and help us actually model some of the lessons, you know, it's a really powerful time. We also want, like this is uh, a group on the right, they're putting together one of the raised beds from our kits so they can feel confident enough to go back with a group of students and do it um, with, their, with their students and volunteers, hopefully, uh, for you know, immediate success. So um, we do offer turnkey garden kits as part of our school gardening program. Uh, these were put together to be um, a, a convenience for educators, um, particularly those who are in the classroom all day and don't have time to source materials. Um, they are not the end all be all, but they are, um, we think, an excellent um, solution for those who maybe are unsure of how to get started, what materials might be uh, best suited for students and, um, and small scale gardens. So these um, turnkey kits were designed to really just put things, they're delivered right to the school. So that's kind of the goal was, you know, if I had a grant and I needed to spend, you know, $1,500 within a month, what would I as a horticulturist and my years of experience purchase to get off to a good start? So that's what, how the kits are set up. Um, they do include everything from, you know, the soil that fills the bed, the mulch around the bed, the bed itself, tools, irrigation, um, just about everything you can think of um, that you would need. We also include a worm composting um, setup, like the one you see on the left, um, with a coupon for worms. So don't worry about worms just showing up at your door. We thought that one through. Um, because we have, in the cur STEM curriculum, there are a multitude of worm composting-based lessons. So that is something that can be ongoing even when your garden is growing or you've just sown the seeds or you've just planted the transplants and there's not a lot going on in the garden, this is something that you can always fall back on for uh, a hands-on activity. So we, um, 
One of the sort of magic parts of the kit, I think, is the fact that the, the transplants um, show up at your school four times a year. This is no easy task, <laughs> as we have 200 gardens across the state, but like I said before, we've marshaled not only Clemson's resources, but those of our partners around the state, and um, we came up with a way to uh, to get transplants and seeds out to um, you know out to the uh, the community and so that's part of the program we also offer summer workshops like this usually in person but right now we're making do we can also tailor professional development classes to meet the needs of a school or a district and um, we do have um, ways that we can stay in touch we have a, a blog that we um, post to quite regularly so you can follow that. And we're also on social media on pretty much all the outlets you can think of. Um, and this summer, you know, as you know, as you're here, we're offering the, um, the webinars uh, throughout the summer and we'll have the next one on August 6th. Um, and it will be led by um, South Carolina DHEX Don't Waste Food SC program coordinators. Um, they'll be our content experts for that one. So we're really excited to have them on board for the next for the next webinar. So I'm wondering how many questions we had in the chat um, that I need to answer. Patricia, Megan. Amy, Amy if somebody missed um, if somebody was sad that the hands-on workshop portions of the class were not able to be held, when we sort of have our next cohort, we start having those workshops again, will we be able to advertise out to the people that? Yeah, we'll go back and we'll for sure let everyone know that may have missed. Um, the last workshop we did was, was sparsely attended because a lot of administrators were sort of, you know, holding people back from um, attending things in person. And we understood that. We went ahead and held it because we already had everything booked and the lunches were coming and the programs were coming and, you know, it just kind of, we had to move forward, but we, I think we had 50 or 60 people that were supposed to be there and only like 20 came. So I totally understand that. I can't, I mean, literally cannot wait to like just see everybody and welcome them back. But, um, but yes, we will, we will be in touch about that. So, um, and then I think Ben is going to cover too. One of the other questions were, how do you qualify for that turnkey garden kit? Yeah. And I think when Ben talks, he'll, he'll cover a little bit of that and hopefully answer that question. And so, you know, we have, there are a lot of ways to do that. You know, we have people, we have some schools who have written outside grants, like Ben's going to talk about in a minute. Some people go through the competitive grant program that, um, that the Ben's uh, office holds where they work with us directly on that and they do 20 gardens per year through that program. But we also have some folks who are finding funds in other ways, like through PTAs and fundraisers and, you know, or maybe they just have a pot of money, you know, that their administrators like, yes, you can do this. So we've had a lot of people come at it from different ways. Um, and I should have elaborated on that. We, um, we don't just do school garden kits. Um, just like we're Lowe's or something. I mean, you have to go through the course first. And so, you know, we'll, we can talk about that more. So Ben, I believe you are next on our agenda. Um, so I'm going to let you. Um, real quick, Amy, just for some of those folks that stopped in late, we're just going to do a real quick, uh, another reminder that this is a webinar. Um, if you have comments, please put them in the chat because we love you to have your comments in there. If you have specific questions so that they don't get lost and we can circle back and answer those later, please put those in the Q&A. Um, so comments in the chat. Um, if you have uh, specific questions, try to get those in our Q&A section and we will hopefully circle back to those um, as we go. Just a couple questions in the chat. Um, Whoa. Um, uh, BCCW. I'm not sure what that stands for, Joey. Um, I'm answering that one. I'll okay. answer that one in a minute. Okay, okay. Ben, I'm going to turn this over to you to share your screen and, um, and present for us on uh, garden grants. Is it sharing yet? I got it. Okay, everybody good? Uh, 
Thanks, Amy. I, again, I appreciate everybody that's attending today and uh, every all the presenters as well, the ones that aren't here, every, all the information that's shared. I mean, it really, uh, to, to use a cliche, takes a village and all these partners uh, and everybody on the ground level attending. It really takes a, a group effort to be successful. But um, <clears throat> again, my name's Ben. I work for the Department of Education, Office of Health and nutrition uh, under their farm and school program. Uh, my contact information. I just want to give you a little background information of the farm and school program in South Carolina. Um, I'll talk about some of the events that we put on and programs that I help uh, run with the Department of Agriculture and Clemson and some other partners uh, currently, as well as uh, I'll talk about grants in general and funding opportunities that are available uh, for school districts and uh, other entities out there. But if you ever have any questions, I just want to preface this with, please feel free to reach out to me. I'm here to help implement uh, programs at the ground level. Uh, again, I, I included my email. That's probably the best way to get in touch with me. And uh, feel free to reach out to me. But Farm School in South Carolina began in 2011. Uh, with these five entities that you see on the screen, Department of Agriculture, uh, DHEC, DSS, Clemson, and the Department of Education all came together uh, through some funding through CDC and created this program to help promote agriculture and nutrition education across the state and uh, increase vegetable consumption and, and basically healthy eating habits long term to combat a lot of diseases and other things like obesity uh, occurring out there. But over the years it evolved, it was always a very collaborative effort between these state entities. Um, we expanded into child care centers, uh, Department of Juvenile Justice started some farms and those efforts eventually expanded to uh, other institutional settings, universities, food banks, and small retail markets. Um, currently, uh, the Department of Agriculture in South Carolina is the implementing agency for Farm to School. I work with a lot of folks over there. Uh, Laura Kate um, McAllister and Katie Pfeiffer are very vital in the programming that I do. Um, Again, we're a part of the National Farm to School Network. Uh, Department of Education is a supporting partner in that effort, and Department of Agriculture is the core partner. So I, I put one website up there, and again, you guys have all these links from this morning's email through the MailChimp, MailChimp link. And uh, Farm to School has so much information and resources, the National Farm to School Network link that I'm talking about. Uh, it really, if you're doing research for a graduate degree or just want to learn basically about anything agriculture and nutrition based uh, under Farm to School, this website is a lot of information, probably more than you want. But um, moving on, uh, we have a website, South Carolina Farm to School dot com. Uh, we do we have resources for teachers, food service, farmers. Uh, again, we're trying to get more local produce in the school system. It's kind of with uh, everything going on right now, an interesting process, but that's really part of my job to help uh, food service staff uh, help procure more local fruits and vegetables for kids in the schools, as, as well as school garden portion that Amy and, and Patricia and Clemson Extension are vital in and uh, other projects as well. So. Uh, I'm sure all of you have seen this uh, symbol before. Again, like I said, working with the Department of Agriculture, it's very important to promote South Carolina uh, produce and support local farms. You know, farming is a very difficult profession. Um, South Carolina has a wonderful growing season, as a lot of you know, so you can get a lot of wonderful fruits and vegetables really throughout the year. We, we can grow kale, collards all year long and in the summer with strawberries, peaches. Uh, who's getting some peaches right now? They're absolutely delicious. So again, we try to promote this to kids, uh, brand uh, specific, like getting them to go to local farmers markets, to get farmers to come talk to your kids about what they do. Uh, there's a lot of 
a big gap in farm uh, employees. You know, a lot of the farmers are getting a lot older. So we, we also need to encourage a lot of these younger generation uh, to get out there and, and want to produce food. So uh, if you want this symbol, we can, um, you know, get this out to you, this logo and some other promotional materials. Uh, we have a, uh, this website that you can fill out an application. Uh, this is another resource that we offer the Palmetto Pick of the Month. We have uh, a newsletter associated with each month with some nutritional information. Uh, there are basically one pagers right now, but growing information, nutritional information can all comes with each of these monthly products. And this is basically when we're harvesting the most of each individual project product through the month. Uh, collards, again, like I said, we can grow throughout the year, but uh, same thing with uh, kale and some other greens. But when most of this is coming to harvest is when we chose for the individual month and we have a lot of these posters I can ship out again you just need to reach out to me uh, just trying to promote local produce so I want to start with October I know it's kind of a weird month to start but uh, October is farm to school month it's national farm to school month there's a mandate out there through Congress that says that uh, South Carolina we try to promote a lot of things this month I go out typically to a lot of schools and and uh, help them implement some programming around this month. We have a Make Your Plate SC Grown Week that you can take the pledge and a lot of other resources and toolkits uh, that we can get to you to help uh, you do stuff at, at the ground level. Um, also, just to go ahead and jump into this, <clears throat> because there's always already been a question about this, um, you know, the Department of Education recognizes health and eating habits and school gardens is a vital part of that. Uh, teaching kids how to grow produce at an early age and introducing them to how food is actually grown uh, is, is a main, major factor in getting them to eat healthy. So um, we, we sponsor 20 gardens a year. We sponsor school gardening for SC educators program. The all the programming that Amy talked about earlier with the garden stem curriculum, uh, you know, the trainings, all the materials, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, schools in South Carolina, as long as you're participating in the national school lunch program, you are um, eligible to apply for this. Um, unfortunately, we, this is going to be the third year we do this and you see, 20 schools up on the screen right now. Uh, this is kind of a one and done deal. So if you see your school up here, and I'm gonna show another screen in a second, uh, unfortunately you're not eligible to participate in, in the free garden that I'm speaking of. Um, but again, this is, we're just sponsoring Amy's and uh, School Gardening for ST Educators program. Um, Again, here's the other list. I'll give you a little time to look at that. Uh, within the links that last year's application, uh, we included that so you can look at it. It'll be very similar to this year. Again, we released this in October because it's National Farm and School Month, and that's one of the big promotions we try to get out there and help you guys implement things um, at your schools. Uh, so hope everybody's had a chance to look and see if you're on there again if you have any questions reach out to me uh, the, the application is very very simple um, it is based somewhat off of uh, free and reduced rates and uh, community eligibility provision which throws incentives for schools that are like title one per se and some other schools that kind of get a leg up so if you're in that category you know this is very entry level we want to get you some school gardens at your schools and um, you know depending on what happens in the fall we'll evolve uh, with whatever schools do so uh, again um, there will be more information about this program in the future um, another thing that we promote in October out of my office uh, I just want to say the school garden um, they're eligible, like I said, for anybody in National School Lunch Program, K through 12. 
we have had some high schools that we awarded. So um, again, it depends on your application. There's a scoring rubric that goes along with it and um, K through 12. So another thing, like I said, the junior chef competition, this is uh, for culinary folks in high school and at Kate centers. Uh, we did it for the first time last year. It went great. There's uh, the USDA is heavily involved in this. Uh, we have a Southeast regional competition, the state winner, which Lexington Richland Fives Kate Center won this year. Uh, if everything wouldn't have, uh, the COVID wouldn't have kind of shut everything down. Uh, these folks are able to go to a regional competition in um, Kentucky and compete for full scholarships to Sullivan University in Louisville. Uh, so there's a lot of scholarship money that revolves around this. Even the state winner gets uh, a portion of a scholarship if they want to go to a culinary school. And uh, Sullivan's uh, culinary school is one of the top in the nation. So it's a very reputable culinary school. So again, applications, we usually put the applications out in September, um, but they close in October. Again, this is for uh, high school Kate level folks, and you have to be a part of the National School Lunch Program for that as well. Um, one thing we do typically February, March, um, Again, like I, I mentioned earlier, we, I work very closely with the South Carolina Department of Agriculture, uh, Laura Kate McAllister with the Specialty Crop Growers Association, uh, and Katie Pfeiffer with the retail side. Uh, we put together a grower buyer meetup, pull together a lot of local producers, uh, school food service, anybody that wants to come to learn more about local produce and where to go, how to buy it, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of state agencies here to give uh, information as well. Uh, it usually takes place at um, the Phillips Market Center in West Columbia at the State Farmers Market. So it's a great event. Again, it's free. Um, so any questions, just reach out to me. Uh, we also, one thing that I do is a South Carolina Farm to Summer Challenge. It kind of got postponed this year. Um, just again, a lot of the schools out there participate in the summer programs that feed children, um, whether it's through what is called F SFFP or SSO, uh, you can reach out to your food service director if you need more information about that, but just try to help, uh, those programs again, feed local produce since summer is such a great time for that. Uh, to the kids through the summer through these entitlement programs. Okay, <clears throat> so I mentioned the one little, um, we'll call it a grant about, you know, through our office that supports Amy's program with the school gardens. Also wanted to kind of, I'm going to start with grants from a federal level and kind of go down through state and uh, local, and just kind of give you some ideas of you know, everybody needs money, right? I mean, you can't do any of this without money. And I want you to think really high level to start with. Some of you may be here, some of you may not be at this level yet, um, but there's all kinds of federal grants out there. Um, let me show my mouse. I think everybody can see my mouse. Over here on the right is farm to school planning and implementation grants. I want to do that. Uh, equipment assistant grants did it again and community fa facility grants and loans so those are what is available to public private indian tribal schools just that little three blocks on the right side and my whole point of showing this schematic is if you start partnering with nonprofits or state agencies or, or even businesses or other entities city government etc that opens depending on who you're partnering with opens up all these other federal grants for you so like i mentioned at the very beginning you know it takes a village uh working with other partners really opens the door for a lot of funding so uh just kind of you know keep an open mind um think outside the box who's in your area and it's really going to depend on where you are 
to what works, you know? So you have to evaluate your area, see who's willing to work with you, et cetera, et cetera, and find this specific grants that you may want to apply for. Again, this, these are federal grants. They're fairly complicated. You, you need to jump through some hoops, like get a DUNS number and some other uh, formal things that you will have to do to even apply to these grants. So it takes some time. You will need some help. I wouldn't try to accomplish some of these federal grants on your own unless you're very experienced with it. Um, like I mentioned, farm to school planning and implementation grants, that is the one that I try to focus on the most because that is specifically meant for school districts. Uh, these are large federal grants from a year to two years. My office also does the assistant grants, equipment assistant grants to try to help you, you know, do more scratch cooking at schools. Um, Planning grants, again, you have to think outside the box. There's so many opportunities. You really have to get your ideas on paper um, and really what works for you. I mean, you can try to procure more local foods. Um, a lot of programming around school gardens, obviously. Three school, two school districts actually received these grants last week. Um, Lexington Richland 5 here and I want to read I'm going to look at my other screen but I want to read you their programming uh, and what they're doing with their grant and also Charleston County Schools uh, received hundred thousand dollar grants both those districts did so I'm going to briefly read you their synopsis um, the Charleston County Farm to School project will serve children ages four to 10 who attend five Title I elementary schools in Charleston County, South Carolina. The, the one-year implementation project includes farm to cafeteria initiatives, school garden education, farm field trips, history, culture, and farming field days, and a community harvest dinner. So they got $100,000 by submitting their grant. And again, that's pretty general, but uh, it had to do with school gardens. You know, it had to do with history, culture. They, they really brought in a lot of programming and uh, they were awarded. So that's great. Um, school District 5 of Lexington, Richland counties. They're doing a food waste challenge that will expand the district's farm to school practices by introducing food waste recycling into the school lunch program. Uh, the, the project will implement pre and post consumer food waste recycling at five schools for conversion into compost that will be used in school gardens and farms as part of the district's agriculture and bio systems program. So they're, they're doing all inclusive again both both are, my point of that is reading that is both are reaching more than one school for these federal grants it's kind of a district-wide program they're including k through 12 as well as uh some kate programs so you just gotta include everyone uh reach as many people as you can et cetera. Et cetera. these are 20 to fifty thousand dollars for the planning grants um, there is a match involved, but typically that can be in kind. Um, I don't want to get in too much detail about these, but uh, again, there's a, two different tracks of planning for folks that are really beginning, just starting, and an implementation track for folks that are a little farther along, and the implementation are up to $100,000. Again, all of these have matches and can be over a one to two year period but you really need partners to make this happen. Uh, both those school districts do. I didn't read out their partners, but it's just not them. Um, so moving on from the federal grants, I know that was quick, but it's gonna be a long day. Um, also think about your state and local governments. You know, I'm gonna talk briefly about some specific grants and also give examples, but uh, DHEC has some grants. Uh, we have the program through that sponsors Amy's um, School Gardening for SC Educators. SCDA has the Crop Block Grant. Um, soil and Water Districts have money. Cities, uh, you, you just have to reach out and ask questions. Uh, that's, if you get denied, that's okay, but you'll never know if you don't ask. 
Uh, also local businesses. There's districts out there that, you know, have really done a great job partnering with businesses that have uh, similar goals, Ace Hardware, Lowe's, Tractor Supply, all these guys donate products to schools uh, for school gardens. <clears throat> Excuse me. So reach out to those folks. Um, the South Carolina State Library is a wonderful place to go. Now they have all of their trainings online where you used to have to go in person to state library branches. Uh, here's the link. Um, there's all kinds of webinars and tutorials on this link. Um, funding resources, how to write grants. If you've never, never dip your toe into that, there's uh, again, lots of grant writing and research assistance on the South Carolina State Library website. Uh, this is just an example. I know it's an old one. Um, I don't know all the soil and water conservation district policies and grants out there, but since I'm in Richland County, I'm kind of tapped into that pretty well, and they offer a mini grant. And there may be other soil and water districts out there that offer mini grants that are for school gardens and uh, environmental projects. So just have to reach out and ask, just want you to be aware that there's, there's money out there in certain places. Um, all these smart kids is again, just an example. Um, they have a grant that is open pretty much all year. Uh, it's not open around Christmas, January, February to December. Uh, these projects, uh, range from $50 gift cards to $5,000 uh, larger kind of longer term projects. So they all uh, revolve around physical activity, nutri nutrition, um, socializing arts. So all that kind of plays into the same programming that we talk about. Palmetto Pride uh, is a great South Carolina organization. Uh, they're all about beautification and litter prevention. Uh, they have various grants, again, that you may be able to tie in some of the projects that you're incorporating at your schools. Tree grant, um, again, a lot of beautification things uh, for schools, cities, um, et cetera. So check them out. They're a great organization to work with. Um, I mentioned DHEC earlier. They have a specific grant and I assume all these grants will continue. This one should August, excuse me, open in August. Uh, it typically closes in October and they ward pretty quickly after that. Um, but, you know, it's about environmental awareness, which again, kind of overlaps the school gardens, uh, everything that we kind of try to incorporate as well. Um, other competitive grants, there's so many resources out there, it kind of gets overwhelming. So these are some of my favorite ones. Uh, Kids Gardening is a great website to go for all kinds of information. Whole Kids, Captain Planet is more environmentally based. Uh, and then I mentioned the Aldi Smart Kids earlier, but all four of these websites will have tremendous amounts of information, uh, some curriculum. Um, and a lot of grant links to all kinds of different stuff. So I say check it out. Uh, typically, I just wanted to mention, if you ever have a career day, once we get going back again, farm to school event or a wellness event, science fairs, I'll be glad to come out and help or assist with that as well. As part of my job is going out to some of these and supporting them at the school level. So again, just feel free to reach out to me. Um, and I do have a couple of these guys, some jokes who likes jokes. So I'm, I like the cornier, the better kind of deal. <laughs> I like that Samsung raise your hand. I like that. Let, I, since you raised your hand, I wanted to ask this before I get going and end. Um, can you raise your hand if you were on the last grant? If you are on the la or last webinar, please raise your hand. Awesome. Okay, cool. Well, thank y'all. I just wanted to try that out. It worked good. And uh, I appreciate everybody on this one and all of y'all that have been on both of them. Again, like Amy said, we'll have a third one in August. 
please uh, join us then too. So I added a couple uh, jokes too. Um, I know I'm kind of carrying on here, but I'll be quick. So what do you call, again, I like these corny, these are good kid jokes. What do you call an alligator in a vest? An investigator, yay. Um, why should you always knock on the fridge door before opening it? Just in case there's a salad dressing. And I added a few new ones. Why did the fungi, fungi leave the party? There wasn't much room. Uh, huh, huh, huh. Okay, where do cows go for lunch? The cafeteria. Huh, huh, huh. Here's another one. What did the cow cross the road? Get to the other side. What did the mama cow say to the baby cow? It's past your bedtime. And finally, what did you get if you cross an angry sheep and a moody cow? An animal that's in a bad mood. So thank you, thank you. That was a bit much. Wow, thank you, Ben. That was that, that was something that, else. It was. Let me tell you. So again, please reach out to me, especially about the grants. Uh, I'll be glad to help you, and uh, y'all have a nice afternoon. <laughs> ben, the comment. You gotta go back and read the comments about your. I know, job. I do. I know. I'm dragging time, so that kind of went lengthy. I apologize. I love it. All right, thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna um, I'm gonna pull rank on the uh, on the schedule a little bit, and I'm gonna let everybody take a break now, and then we're going to do. Um, we're gonna open the Ag in the Classroom video, and then we're gonna go straight to Patricia's presentation. So I wanna invite everyone to um, take a quick moment to um, take a break. How's that sound? So it is 11.47. Let's take like a three minute stretch break and come back shortly. We'll come back at 1150. Is three minutes long enough?
All right, is everybody back? We're getting close to being back. Ben, you ready? Has it been three minutes? I think it has been. Okay, well, I am gonna share our um, colleague, Tracy Miss Kelly from South Carolina Ag in the Classroom, who would dearly love to be here today, but who had to um, do uh, meet a farmer, believe it or not. So um, I'm gonna start her presentation and then we'll get started with Patricia. Good morning, everyone. My name is Tracy Miskelly, and I am the director of Ag in the Classroom for South Carolina Farm Bureau. I'm sorry that I was not able to be live with you today. I had another obligation um, that I had to attend to, so um, I wanted to make sure that you were able to get this information because I believe it's very valuable and I believe it's very useful for you as educators or even community members. Uh, know that you are learning lots on this webinar. Um, Amy is a great resource to have and, and those folks that are on today and I know that you will walk away with many new ideas and new knowledge that you can implement in your classrooms. So who am I? Well I'm a former classroom teacher. I've taught kindergarten, first, second, and third grades here in South Carolina. I'm early childhood certified and I also have experience as a school-based literacy coach. I do not have a background in agriculture. Um, I'm married into agriculture. My husband and his family have a small beef cattle operation and um, my worlds kind of came together with uh, when I saw this job posted. And so here I am um, almost two years later in this position. Yes, I told you I work for Farm Bureau, but I promise I'm not here to sell you insurance. Um, South Carolina Farm Bureau is a grassroots membership based organization and yes insurance is a membership benefit so if you do have South Carolina Farm Bureau insurance you are a member um, but there are many more facets to this organization than that uh, this was started in 1944 by a group of farmers who really wanted to band together to have their voices heard in the General Assembly because very much like teachers there are um, there is not a lot of representation uh, on their behalf and so sometimes policies are not um, ag friendly and so this organization really advocates for farmers and for rural South Carolina. Um, you do not have to be a farmer to be a member. Uh, there are membership benefits like I said, um, insurance is one, there are discounts on many different places um, like uh, hotel discounts, car rental discounts, discounts to the Riverbank Zoo, um, all kinds of different things, and you can actually find that on our website. But Mr. Harry Ott is pictured here. He is our sixth South Carolina Farm Bureau president, elected in 2015. He is a row crop farmer from Calhoun County, and um, he and his brother grow cotton corn, peanuts, all sorts of things. But Mr. Ott has a diverse background in that he actually started in education and I really appreciate that because he has that kind of teacher brain um, but he also has policy knowledge he was a member of the South Carolina House of Representatives for uh, a while and served on many various committees and then in 2013 was actually appointed to be the director of the Farm Service Agency here in South Carolina by the Obama administration so he's a farmer he has that educational background and that policy knowledge to be a great leader for our organization. Now, what is Ag in the Classroom? So this program um, was actually chartered in the 1980s. It's a national organization, National Ag in the Classroom, um, because there was a trend of more and more people moving away from the farm, which in turn, um, people didn't know where their food and fiber comes from. Uh, Spoiler alert, it doesn't just show up at Ilo or Food Line or Whole Foods or anywhere that you shop. There's a lot of work that goes into it before it gets there. And so um, this, this organization was created to increase agricultural literacy. And it looks different. Programs from state to state um, look different in what they do. 
but their mission is pretty much all the same. In South Carolina, we are under the Farm Bureau umbrella, and that, that's the case in about half of our 50 states. And then in the other half of the states, it's either associated with a land grant university or it's State Department of Agriculture. So why do we need to talk about ag? Well, we all like to eat, right? I do, I know, anyway. Um, but farmers are only 1% of our population. And, you know, the average age of a farmer is about 60 years old in America right now. And, and that worries me in that, um, you know, there are more people being born every day, less arable land um, that we have to work. And, and this, is a, this is a real STEM problem, if there ever was one. You can see from this graphic, um, in the early 1900s, the average American farmer fed anywhere from nine to 10 people, which, you know, what we know historically about family size, that was probably their immediate family. In today's world, the average farmer feeds anywhere from 155 to 165 people. Insane. Farmers are having to do more with less than they've ever done. And I think this, this uh, information can help engage students. You know, um, a lot of agricultural topics, just like Amy School Gardens, are very hands-on. You know, it's hands-on learning, it's relevant. You know, students wanna know, why do I need to know this? Well, we need to know where our food comes from. Um, so I think this topic can be introduced across the curriculum. There are ways to fit it in in every single subject that is taught, um, and it's very relevant. In South Carolina, agriculture contributes over $42 billion to our state's economy, and there's still about 5 million acres in farmland, just under 25,000 farms. Now, um, USDA will tell you that any farm, or the definition of a farm is any operation that can profit or has the ability to profit over a thousand dollars. So those 25,000 farms in South Carolina are all shapes and sizes. And very diverse in nature. You can see this is a resource that we offer. You can find on our website. This is our commodities map. Um, very diverse uh, commodities that we see here in our state, from livestock to row crops to uh, greenhouse nurseries to dairies. Um, we pretty much run the gamut here in South Carolina. And you can see from our state uh, the diverse landscape that we have. You know, we have a lot of livestock in the upstate. Well, why? Because it's not very conducive to growing a lot of row crops. Um, a lot of our row crops are right here in this I-95 corridor. That's where you'll see your, your cotton and your peanuts and your corn being grown um, in large numbers. And then, you know, we have the mariculture industry on the coast. So very diverse and interesting to see what all we have. So what do we do to increase ag literacy? What do we offer? to meet our mission there. Well, first we offer lesson plans from National Ag in the Classroom to our website to American Farm Bureau. At agclassroom.org, you will find under teacher resources, the curriculum matrix, which is hundreds and hundreds of K-12 lesson plans that are aligned to national learning standards, such as Common Core or Next Generation Science Standards. And when I say lesson plans, these are actually like many units because there are multiple, um, multiple activities that are included in this one lesson plan. So really two to three days, sometimes worth of material. South Carolina Farm Bureau under our AITC tab, you can also find lesson plans and these are aligned to state learning standards. Most of those are K-8 focused. Um, as we leave the high school um, ag teachers to um, really hone in on agriculture in their classes. And then American Farm Bureau also has teacher resources and lesson plans available. So I highly encourage you to um, browse these sites and see what you can find. Um, 
the best part about this are all these lesson plans are free. They're available online um, for free. You don't have to pay anything. On our website, we also offer an initiative called Book of the Month. And, you know, I told y'all reading is my jam. I love literacy. I feel like we can integrate literacy across the curriculum just as we can agriculture. And so I started this program um, January 2019. And basically we select an ag accurate children's book, one that really shows farm life or um, is accurate in its portrayal of farm life, not talking animals and such like that. But it comes with a lesson plan or that mini unit that is aligned to South Carolina state learning standards. It includes ag facts and discussion questions with, that go along with the book, but then a lot of activities that encompass different uh, subjects across the curriculum. Like you'll find probably in the milk makers, I believe there was science, social studies and language arts um, standards. Um, included in that lesson plan. So, and I also try to um, integrate lessons across different grade levels. So, for instance, the milk makers, I think, were, was aligned to K3 standards. Um, no small potatoes was aligned to 2-6 standards. So, a grade level span. But basically, we sell these for $5, the books. And they come with a nice printed copy of the lesson plan. But let's say you already have the book. Well, we archive the lesson plans, the PDFs on our website. So you can navigate to our scfb.org um, page under AITC and click Book of the Month. And down at the bottom, you'll see the archives pages. Um, lots of good information here. Lots of um, hands-on activities for students. We also offer professional development. So this summer already we've hosted three uh, virtual workshops and in July we have actually three more starting on the 21st of July and then on the 29th and 30th. And basically our workshops are um, set up similar structurally but all include a farm tour and then you'll hear from industry experts. And normally if we were in person, we would do um, lesson or model lessons for the participants. But because we're not in person, we've had to kind of change that a little bit to keep it engaging as possible. And so there is a collaboration time with peers where you'll get to talk about integrating agriculture in your classrooms. But those workshops are actually worth 20 renewal credits for any educators in the bunch and they are free this summer. So there's still time to sign up for our July workshops if you're interested. Um, National Ag in the Classroom also offers professional development normally in the, the form of a conference in June of every year. Um, that was not able to happen this June, so they had virtual conference um, as well, but next summer, hopefully, things will be back on track and we will be visiting Des Moines, Iowa for that conference. It's open to any anyone, I mean, you think about it, volunteers, educators, 4-H personnel, any anybody that works with children and, and helping to educate them on agriculture can, can attend this conference. Um, I think the registration fee is like $435, but that also includes several meals, and um, a farm tour, which I really enjoy seeing how diverse agriculture is in other states. Um, and Iowa, of course, is big farm country uh, on a large scale compared to South Carolina, so I'm interested to see what it looks like there and, and see some different types of um, agriculture operations. And then American Farm Bureau also has professional development opportunities. Um, actually, they have an on-the-farm STEM program that they uh, host every summer. The, this is actually beef-focused, was paid for by beef checkoff dollars. Um, so every time a farmer sells cattle, a portion of that goes to this checkoff program, which funds research and educational opportunities. So this is actually free for teachers. And we had two selected this year um, that uh, 
professional development was actually moved to September. So I'm hoping that we still get to attend that, but um, if not, there's always next year. <laughs> and I told you a little bit about our organization with Farm Bureau. So we do have uh, grassroots volunteers. So across the state, we have 47 county Farm Bureau boards, one in every county, two in Horry County. And these volunteer leadership boards, boards of directors, are made up of farmers or of ag enthusiasts in that community, um, people in agribusiness. So basically, um, they're each uh, their own entity, and they each uh, have a budget and, and those sorts of things. And they look for ways to be involved in their communities. Um, we also have programs for youth, for young farmers. The Young Farmers and Ranchers program is actually a leadership development program for 18 to 35 year olds. We have a women's leadership program. And this is uh, Tracy Woodard. She's actually one of our um, leaders from Darlington County. But Tracy um, and many others like her are really interested in teaching students about agriculture. She actually, her and her husband um, are cotton farmers. And this blanket that she's holding in her lap was actually spun from cotton grown on their farm. So the whole process from farm to blanket takes place within the Carolinas. It's all homegrown and home produced. Um, but she's teaching students about that process because you'll see many of them have on cotton shirts, right? We wear that fiber, but a lot of students are unaware that that actually grows on a plant. So great conversations, um, but a lot of these volunteers are willing to come in and vol volunteer their time or um, their knowledge in your classroom. So I'm glad to be a liaison for that. Um, or you can also look on our website, um, stfb.org. And under contact us, you can find your county and your county secretary, and you could reach out to him or her and see um, how you could become a um, really reach out to the county board. We like to um, reward those teachers that are uh, implementing agriculture, and so the Betty J. DeWitt Outstanding Educator Award will be open open August 1st, and this award um, goes to an educator that is working to implement agriculture in their classroom or their school, and basically you submit, um, you know, a picture of what you've been doing through a lesson plan and that sort of thing, and this is a thousand dollar cash prize, so, I mean, a really nice prize. You also are able to come to Myrtle Beach to our annual convention every year in December and be recognized as the state winner. And then you also get an expense paid trip to that National Ag in the Classroom Conference, like I was telling you about, that's in Des Moines, Iowa next year. So a really nice prize um, because, again, we want to reward those teachers that are trying to teach their students about agriculture. We also offer many grants. These are sponsored by our Young Farmers and Ranchers program. We award four every year in the amount of $500. And these can <clears throat> be grants that are focused on school gardens, or maybe it's focused on ag literacy with uh, purchasing some books for your classroom. Or maybe you're interested in honeybees and, and putting an observation hive in your school. Anything of that nature, you can apply for this grant. I hope that I haven't thrown too much uh, information at you. I'll be glad to um, answer any questions if you email me, um, which I'll share my email on the next slide. But I love this quote because like I said at the beginning, whether or not we think we're involved in agriculture, all of us are because we all like to eat and wear that nice fiber, cotton fiber that's grown for us. But my grandfather used to say that once in your life you need a doctor, a lawyer, a policeman, and a preacher, but every day, three times a day, you need a farmer. Uh, I guess I did not include my um, email address on this slide. So, um, Amy, I will send you...
Okay. <laughs> she did forget to send her email address or put it on the slides, but we included it in our resource roundup email that we sent earlier this morning. And um, if you missed that, we'll be sending that out again later. So um, we love working with Tracy and I, I could tell there were a lot of questions in the chat box uh, while I was sharing my screen that I couldn't answer, but I know that uh, Megan and Ben and Patricia have been answering all those and um, we appreciate that. So uh, Tracy is, um, like I said, she just, uh, she texted me uh, earlier. She is uh, on farm and wishes she could be with us, but I told her she has achieved being in two places at once. So um, we've all tried to do that, right? And, and failed. So Patricia Whitener, you're up, my friend, and we are so thrilled. Can you, yeah. are you able to do what you need to do? Um, well, actually, real quick, um, I don't know about you guys, but I am a little bit of a squirmy worm, and I know a lot of the kids that we guys, that we deal with are also as well. So if I want to invite everybody just to stand up real quick, and that includes my panelists, we can see okay. you. Just stand up here. real quick and, uh, and do a little walking in place with me. And I mean, okay, you guys, I, literally, I mean, stand up, like get up, stand up. Do a little walking in place. Okay, Amy's discoing. That's right on. I have to do this with what you ask. Walking in place, when I say snap, you're going to snap. And when I say clap, you're going to clap. All right? So if you're walking in place, you're walking in place, you're moving those hips. All right, snap. See those snaps. Come on, people. Do them both at the same time? All right, snap. Clap. Snap. Snap. Clap. Snap. Clap, snap, clap, keep walking, snap. All right, you guys did that pretty well. I'm sort of impressed. All right, you yeah. have dog on your, on your lap. It's a little bit hard. No, 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 you're not done yet. Okay. You're not done okay. you're not, you're not up. Okay. That okay. was the first initial. You got that down. Now this time, when I say snap, you're going to clap instead. And when I say clap, you've got to snap. Okay. okay. So start your walking in place, start your walking in place. And remember when I say snap, you clap. And when I say clap, you snap. All right. I'm gonna get this wrong, I know. Clapping, snap, clap, snap, snap, clap, snap, clap. <laughs> Look at that. We can't do it, okay. Face. I'm right, pumping now. All right, good. That's the point. All right. That is um, a really easy something to do. I, as you guys know, engaging kids um, virtually is difficult. I'm sure most of you guys have um, uh, found lots of interesting uh, ways to keep your kids moving and motivated. Um, you know, just for us, gosh, I could sit in the front of the screen, screen all day long and not realize it. Um, Amy and I were talking, it's really beneficial to, if you have a phone call, to get up and move um, while you're on that phone call. Um, I do have my coworkers, my furry coworkers that keep me reminding me to get up and move around a little bit as well. So when I do jumping jacks and my Fitbit buzzes and I do jumping jacks, my dogs freak out. They don't know what I'm doing. So um, I have to go hide in the bathroom to do jumping jacks. Well, so my name is, oh yeah. My name is Patricia Whitener, and I will go ahead and do our screen share. Is that up already? Got it. All right. And um, I am, as Amy said, she gave me this amazing, wonderful introduction. I am the um, Greenville County 4-H agent, um, which is the most populated county in our whole state, <clears throat> and it's just me. Um, we... Uh, rely heavily on volunteers. So one of the, the things that has qualified me to do this is not only um, do I manage volunteers and rely on volunteers in order to have a successful program, but I also recently completed um, a volunteer management training course. Um, it was a seven week course. We met twice a week for four hours um, and typically this is an in-person certification, but they did an exceptional job virtually. 
Um, it was through an organization called Hands-On Organization in North Carolina and Points of Light. This is a partnership with our South Carolina Association for Volunteer Administration. Um, if, uh, if you've ever had the opportunity to take a volunteer management training from these folks, they have got this down pat. They really know what they're doing. Um, it was a great training. I'm super excited to share some of that information with you guys. Um, again, the South Carolina Association for Volunteer Administration is a, is a wonderful group to find out more about. Um, but I think what really qualifies me um, to talk about volunteer management is that I'm a volunteer. Um, and I was thinking about it this morning. Um, well, what were some of my first volunteer experiences? And I, and I went back to about 13 years old <clears throat> and I got to volunteer with my church youth group for um, a camp. And so I was a junior counselor with some littles um, and that's kind of what really started off my volunteer experience. And I got so much out of that. I got, um, I got self-esteem. Um, I got responsibility. I had to be in charge of all these crazy five-year-olds. Um, I got um, a sense of belonging. Um, there were a lot of things that that experience was really foundational in, in sort of forming the person that I am today. Another really great early um, experience was, I was about 17, I was in high school, <clears throat> and a group of community organizations here in Clemson did something called a crop walk, which was a walk for hunger. And I helped organize that event. And those skills still serve me to this day. It was so amazing to get to learn um, how to organize an event like that. And of course, we were raising money to help solve the issue of hunger, so it was very meaningful. So, you know, I want you to just take a moment <clears throat> and sort of reflect back on what are some of your experiences as a volunteer, and, and what did that do for you? How did that help shape the person that you are? If you don't volunteer, then reflect on that, you know? What, what are the, some of the barriers that prevent you from, from getting involved at that level? Um, so again, this amazing crash course, um, that's what this is. This is going to be a crash course of condensing like six weeks worth of material into about an hour and 15 minutes. So if you're familiar with the crash course videos, I love those. Um, I watch them all the time. Um, there's, I just have not found a subject yet that I haven't been able to, to learn a little something more about watching this crash course. I recommend them. All right, let's get started. Why aren't you changing? There we go. All right, I, this has been covered a little bit. Amy did a really good job of talking about, um, by the way, what is extension, right? There are students at Clemson University that have no idea that we are a land grant university and what that means. So I always like to start off anything that I'm gonna talk about with any group with a little background of saying, you know, what does it mean that I'm an extension agent? Well, like Amy said, you know, we have, we are a third of Clemson University's mission. We do research, we do teaching, and then we do extension. And we serve as that primary public outreach and service arm of the university. We have a Clemson University extension office in every single county across the entire state of South Carolina. Um, and we do this by being sort of that umbrella organization that brings together all of those amazing researchers, um, all of our legislators and policymakers, and then our general population, our citizens, right? So if you think about it, there are some um, world-renowned scientists at Clemson University that have tackled some huge problems and, and found answers. They don't always um, share that information in a form that is palatable or is able to be received by the general public, right? If you guys all have that professor or, or heard that speaker who's brilliant in their field, but is just no good at, at sort of sharing their story, we have, we have some of those at Clemson. Um, and then, of course, being in every county across the entire state, we interact with local governments, we interact with state governments, we interact with federal agencies. Um, and you hope that these folks are making decisions based on sound research-based evidence. We hope that they're making decisions based on the science, 
we hope that they're making decisions that benefit their constituents, the people that voted them into office, right? So then that leaves the citizen. Where, where are they? You know, their lives are, in fact, are impacted by these policies that legislators make. Um, their lives hopefully are improved by the science and research that Clemson does. How do they get that information? How do they understand that those processes that are going on? And that's where extension is. That's where the average person can walk in you know, post quarantine times, you can walk into um, a, an extension office <clears throat> or attend an extension webinar or um, pick up the phone or send an email to our Home and Garden Information Center um, and find the information that they need um, to be successful. So, hopefully, that's what we'll do a little bit of today as well. So, again, my role in extension is specifically for those citizens that are under the age of 18. It's 4-H youth development. Real quick, in the chat box, if you are a 4-H alumni, give yourself a shout out. If you are in 4-H, you don't even have to be um, in 4-H in South Carolina. It could be anywhere in the country because we are a national, we have the largest and oldest youth development organization in the entire country. So, the 4-H's are head, heart, hands, and health. It is all about experiential project-based learning. That is at the core of our learning model and our curriculum in 4-H. 4-H is exclusively um, disseminated through the land-grant universities across the nation. So what do we do in 4-H? Well, it, a lot of our alumni probably are familiar, or when you hear about 4-H, if you're thinking about your grandparents' 4-H, it's probably cows and cooking. And we still do that, and we love the roots of our 4-H, but we have continued to innovate and expand. Um, and you don't stay relevant for over 100 years as an organization if you're not innovating, and 4-H uh, is no different. So we do STEM. We have an engineering challenge. We do um, natural resources and land management. We have a strong leadership citizenship component. Um, of course, healthy lifestyles, and then traditionally our agricultural and animals. Now, I uh, would love to say that I am an expert in all of these fields, <laughs> but that would not be true. I have to rely on a volunteer base to help me disseminate all of these different project areas. 4-H has seven delivery modes between camps and short-term projects, in-school, after-school programs, and independently pursued projects by children that are county, regional, and state level. There is no way that I could facilitate a child's learning in all of these different areas in all of these different ways by myself. It is just physically impossible. Um, and I'm looking at the top right picture. This is Emma. She's, these are all my 4-H'ers. These are all my pictures. Um, and Emma's working on face masks, sewing our face masks. So she's doing community service and she's also learning sewing skills. I do not sew. I do not cook. I know just enough about livestock to be dangerous. Um, I am more focused on our natural resource programs um, which our gardening program falls under. So right now I have um, over a dozen gardens in South Carolina uh, in Greenville County that I help manage. Um, I think one of my teachers, one of our gardens from Green Charter, Brandy Moss, is on the call today. Shout out to her. But um, so that so I get to sort of directly <clears throat> uh, assist kids in those areas that I am versed in. And my background's in environmental natural resources and wildlife, as Amy said, and her introduction. Um, so I get to, to play around with that. I do, I am on our science team with 4-H, so I am learning a little bit more about um, sort of our traditional engineering um, and chemistry, and so I get to geek out on a little bit of the STEM as well. Um, but when a child comes to me wanting to learn how to cook, or a child comes to me wanting to learn more about rabbits or how to show chickens, um, I am sort of a deer in the headlights. And so that is why I rely on volunteers that have a variety of expertise and passions that they then get to share with the youth in Greenwood County. I'm not sure where that came from, that symbol came from. Um, but uh, <laughs> it's 
caution. Yeah, well, it is a caution because there are five main recognized elements in volunteer management. Um, and there is no way that we will be able to do a deep vibe dive today in all five of these. I wish I could say that after today's seminar that you are going to be completely empowered to be uh, a certified volunteer manager. That is not realistic. That is not going to happen. But what we can do is introduce you to these core concepts that will hopefully help you think about uh, your garden program, your school garden, and how you're gonna engage volunteers in your area a little bit differently, right? It, it really is just about intention. To so go ahead and throw out the expectation that you're gonna get some sort of magic bullet and all of a sudden after the seminar, there's gonna be this line of volunteers at your school knocking down the door waiting to be a part of your garden. It's not realistic. But what we can do is sort of say, all right, this is an important component of my whole garden plan that maybe I hadn't given as much thought to, right? A lot of times when we think about volunteerism and we think about volunteers, it is an afterthought. It is an addition to, and I'm challenging you to say that it is a cornerstone, it is a foundational piece to your programs that deserves that sort of thought. Um, so we are gonna cover these five elements of volunteer management in this way. We are gonna talk about purpose, when you are planning for volunteers and what some of that foundation looks like. How do we get ready for when those volunteers do show up? We're gonna to touch on recruitment um, and we'll kind of circle back to some of the things that Ben shared as well about just knowing who your community is, right? Many hands make light work and it does take a village. Um, and then we'll just briefly cover training appreciation um, and supervising and evaluating. And some of those words kind of make people tense up, like training or supervising, even evaluating. Some of us are, they, we tense up when we hear these words and um, they're important pieces of the, of the puzzle. We have to take into account all of these elements in some way, um, certainly not gonna be experts or be able to do a deep dive into all of these today but um, it, it's something to think about, some food for thought, for sure. All right, so down at the bottom, um, or I'm gonna pull up a poll really quickly. I'm gonna launch this poll. You guys see that? And if you would, go ahead and answer that question. I know not everybody's a school. We've got some, some other visitors here today in the webinar, but whatever it is that you do, whatever your organization is, try to All right, so it looks like we are uh, preaching to the choir. It's like you guys already recognize how valuable volunteers are within your organization. A um, little bit of high turnover. All right, hopefully we can address some of these. Um, all right, so when you're planning for volunteers, it's really essential that we understand um, the real value of a volunteer in our program, whatever that may be. So I'm gonna launch another quick poll. So it sounds like over half of you are recognizing that your volunteers are indispensable. How, how are you using them? Why are they important to your garden? Wow, okay. Hey, Patricia, be sure you share the results at the end so everybody can see. Oh, I'm sorry, I missed that. Thank you.
Okay, so, so it looks like um, most of us are using our volunteers um, to provide that level. Like I, like I spoke about with my volunteers, I can't be an expert in everything. It's just not realistic. And so really drawing on those specific skill sets that you might be lacking in your program, volunteers can uh, bring those to the table. And then yes, additional resources besides just skill sets. Um, there's really no limit to um, what your volunteers might be able to bring to your garden. All right. So, you know, understanding the real value of a volunteer in the garden is going to be essential if you're going to start with your, um, if you're going to start inviting them to be a part of that program, right? If you're not going to just try to, to do it all on your own. How many of you guys do it all on your own, right? Don't answer that, right? There's a lot of us that just try to roll up our sleeves and power through and, and do it all on our own. Um, volunteers are, they'll help you save your sanity. So what is the real value of a volunteer? Let's look at that in dollars of cents, right? So um, if you see, we're actually just below North Carolina and just below national. But think about that. The value of a volunteer hour in South Carolina is $23.21 an hour. Think about that. And when we do that, we do that for Master Gardener programs. Amy and I forgot to pull, pull the most recent data about that for Master Gardeners, Certified Master Gardener Program in South Carolina. We take those numbers, we take this value to the legislators, and we show them the dollar impact that these Master Gardeners have. Green, Greater Greenville Master Gardeners, they're over 500 strong. I can't even begin to tell you. They did their annual fundraiser, um, and they'll pull in $30,000. And then they will disseminate that out to Greenville County and they will fund my school gardens. They will fund community gardens. They give junior master gardener camp scholarships. It is unbelievable what this group of people contributes back to the community after going through that certification program. And so it, knowing the real value, not just saying, oh, it gives me a warm feeling in my heart. It makes my life easier. But knowing that there is a dollar amount attached to when a volunteer gives you their time or their resources or their skills, kind of help you understand and appreciate that they are not an after afterthought, right? That there's a real um, monetary value associated with that. As the value of volunteering has gone up over the last few years, the actual number of volunteers has gone down. So that value is only gonna continue to increase as our pool shrinks. Um, actually, let's do our Mentimeter right now. So I got another little question I'd like to ask. Um, and so what I'm going to do is we're going to do a word cloud. So I'm going to put a link in our chat. And I want you guys to click on that and enter, answer the question and enter in your word. And then Amy is going to give us our live results. So Amy, if you'll take over the screen, everybody, this is, we're going to create a little word cloud because I want to, I want to kind of see um, what you guys think is a motivator for volunteerism. So if you'll click on that link, it should take you to an opportunity to just punch in one or two words, just give me a phrase or two on why you think volunteer. What motivates people to volunteer? So in the chat, you should have a link that takes you to menti.com. And if you click on that, it looks like we're having trouble. Ben, if you click on it, does it come up for you? So 
So you, you should get a screen that says, why do people volunteer? Just enter a word. In the chat box, does everybody see that link? Ah, excellent. Loverly. Yeah, yeah. So we've got community, we've got help, compassion, we've got fulfillment is jumping out, satisfaction, that's an interesting word. Um, love, I love that. Absolutely. These are all good motivators for volunteering. To learn so, more. Yeah, this is a depth. Say it again. To learn more, you know, a lot of master gardeners, you know, come to that program. I can say that because I'm a former master gardener coordinator. You know, they came to learn, but they stayed to help. So I think that's a good, you know, a good reason. Yeah, I, I think all of these are really valid reasons. Um, and I love that Dinah and Dolly were in there when we tested that out. Um, <laughs> Those are my dogs. Amy, Amy Dobbs rescue dogs names in there. Um, so, okay, we've got some more words. Great. Yeah. Obligation. Okay. Uh, feel guilty when you're watching everybody else contribute. So you got to jump in there too. Yeah. I, I yeah. With yep. All right, I'm going to stop sharing now, Patricia, so you can have the screen. Yeah, you can go ahead back. That's great. Thank you guys for that. And share screen. Okay. So those were all really wonderful reasons um, that inspire people to volunteer. This hands-on group that did such a great job with our management training series, they say that to volunteer is to choose to act in recognition of a need, right? You see a need you want to address it. Um, it's an attitude of social responsibility, right? And I saw that in some of the words there, right? There's a sense of wanting to give back, wanting to contribute, wanting to be a part of that community. It's not at all for any sort of monetary profit. Um, and it is a sacrifice in some ways. I mean, you think about how valuable time is to all of us um, and how limited some of us resources are um, to take that extra step, you are going beyond just a basic obligation of being a good person. You are were, you were taking it one step further when you are a volunteer. Again, this is all about understanding the value of volunteers. If we don't start here, then all those other elements are going to be built on a foundation of sand. So why garden? Huh. And my picture has gone away, Amy. Not sure where that has gone. All right. Um, sometimes, so, you, sometimes, Patricia, when you're presenting from Canva, sometimes you, it might be, um, if you're doing it online, yeah. So there should be an image here, <laughs> and there's not, but I will tell you what it is. It's, it is about a why. Why do you have a garden? Why are you in this webinar? Why are you taking the small uh, school gardening South Carolina educators class? Why are you going above and beyond your basic obligation as a teacher, as an educator, to add all of this extra work on your already overflowing plate, right? Why do this, right? There, so we have to understand what our motivation is. Not only do we have to have a vision for our school garden, but we need to be able to articulate that to potential volunteers. What is the purpose, right? And so Simon Sinek, if any of y'all are familiar with him, he's got numerous books out, numerous YouTube videos. You can Google him and find out everything you wanted to know about Simon Sinek. He is typically a motivational speaker for the business world and for corporations. But I will tell you, in our Extension Emerging Leadership Group that I was able to be a part of, as was Amy, um, we were introduced to understanding our why, right? Why is it that I do what I do? Because a lot of extension, yes, it is a state job, just like a teacher, 
Yes, I do get benefits. I do get insurance. I am paid a salary. But at the same time, I don't spend the amount of time. I don't put in the passion. I don't work all the extra hours just for that, just for the money. It's not for the money and the glory. There has to be another reason. And so when we talk about why, we want to know what the contribution is and what the impact is. So my why is two. So the word two is, should be at the beginning of the sentence. So if you have a piece of paper or a pen handy and you're taking notes, I challenge you to write down a sentence that starts with the word two, blank, so that, blank. So you're, when you're formulating your why sentence, you want to know two, what is your contribution so that you have what impact? So my why is to connect people with and spark an interest in the natural world so that they are inspired to explore and protect their environment, right? Everything I do in all areas of my work is informed by my why statement. And if you don't have a why statement for your garden, for your school garden program, you're not going to be able to communicate that to the public. You're not going to be able to communicate that to parents, to administrators, to your kids, to your community. And people are going to be coming to you wondering, you know, there's nothing worse than a volunteer showing up and saying, hey, yeah, I'm interested in school gardens. Uh, I have a kid that goes to school here. How can I help? And you, you got nothing. You got nothing for them, right? You have to communicate. Um, you have to know what your why is for your garden, um, if you're going to be able to communicate that effectively to potential volunteer groups. So to blank, so that blank. What's your contribution and what's your impact? All right, and research tells us um, that there are um, tangible benefits to being out in nature, being out in the garden. For kids, those are really obvious. So is your garden um, all about STEM? Is your garden all about healthy eating? Do you uh, have, um, you wanna have art in your garden? Is your garden gonna be about sensory? What, what's the driving force? What's the main theme for your garden? What, it, what, it, what outcomes are you trying to achieve? What benefits are you trying to give these children? And that's gonna inform you in um, what kind of volunteers you're gonna to wanna to, um, recruit. Having an intention so that you can align that with a volunteer's intention is really important. Um, you know, and when you understand the benefits of gardens for adults, you can connect that benefit with what a volunteer is seeking. Think back to that world cloud and all of those reasons, all of those motivators of why people volunteer. How can you connect that with your volunteers why, right? It also helps you in your vetting process, right? You're understanding their motivation for wanting to contribute. So again, all of this is about volunteers purpose and understanding the value of a volunteer. This is all part of your garden program planning. Huh, I'm really disappointed. I've been through this presentation, I don't know how many times, Amy, and now all of a sudden, my pictures have all disappeared. Are you, in, are you in present mode in Canva? Let me go back here. Try refreshing your browser. Yeah. I apologize, everyone. Um, I'm not sure. Back in present mode. I think you're going to be good now. Yeah, because there, look, it fixed your. Um, ah, there we go. Yeah, it fixed your thing, and yeah. So. And there's your 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 why statement thing. Sometimes. So do I need to? You can push present again, and then um, it it's yeah. All right. Okay. All right, sorry about that, guys. Welcome to the wonderful world of hands-on programming virtually. We've all, all right, so may, hopefully makes it understand what I was asking for you to do is, is to, to craft your why statement, the purpose behind your garden. And there's mine. All right, so we talked a little about planning with a purpose. 
talked a little bit about having a, an intention, setting a, a why statement for your garden, um, you know, which is a good exercise to do just to, for you personally as well. You know, I think teachers are so overworked and underpaid and we just keep adding more and more and more onto the plate of what we expect teachers to be responsible for. So sometimes it's helpful, especially at times like these, to sort of drop back and, and reflect on why did I become a teacher? <laughs> And, and how am I helping? Um, you are the most important people. So let's talk a little bit about recruitment, right? It's sort of the next piece of that, um, of those elements of volunteering. And it's important to know who, who are our volunteer groups in our country today. So if you had to guess, who do you think is contributing their valuable time and skills to the community? And you could just throw that in the chat. Who do you think is doing that? Is it our seniors? Is it our, um, our service workers? Who is it? Is it our millionaires? Teachers, yeah. <laughs> Parents? Retirees, we have a lot of retirees that that are able to take our Master Gardener program. Sharon says it's everybody. Yeah. And she's probably right. But let's, let's look a little bit more. Um, and again, this comes from that amazing training that I got to be a part of. Um, some of this data, and you'll see down here at uh, nationalservice.gov is an incredibly, um, rich site for information. Um, we do know that some of our volunteers are donating to charity at twice the rate of non-volunteers and that volunteers belong to groups, organizations, associations at five times the rate of non-volunteers. So just within your organizations, right? So when you think about that, there's alumni, there's 4-H alumni that we rely on heavily to not only be volunteers, but to make financial donations. Um, I will tell you, I had a 4-H'er whose house burned um, right before Christmas, and I reached out to the community, um, but I reached out within the Extension organization, and my God, Extension, I had $5,000 in my hand to, hand to hand this kid in like 36 hours, right before the holidays. I will tell you, um, just accessing those folks that are already embedded in an organization um, is, is a great place to start. A lot of times we don't think about that, um, but I will tell you I have 14 agents in the Greenville County office and I am regularly asking them <laughs> and they regularly contribute. Um, there is that sense of belonging already embedded in being a member of Clemson Extension family, being a, a Clemson University alumni, being a 4-H alumni, that there's a lot of power in that. So a lot of our volunteers, um, you know, you think about Sertoma clubs. There are um, organizations like Scouts, right? There's an identity there. Um, the Kiwanis, the um, Ruritans, right? There are a lot of these um, organizations and associations um, that are important to tap into. We know that our volunteers are our next door neighbors. We know that our volunteers are within the community. They're invested in community building. So volunteers do something good for their neighborhood at three times the rate of non-volunteers. We know that volunteers will do favors for their immediate neighbors at twice the rate of non-volunteers. So a lot of our schools are right in the middle of subdivisions, right in the middle of suburbia, right in the middle of neighborhoods. And so are there businesses in that neighborhood? Are there um, retirees in that neighborhood? Are there um, just going door to door? Uh, even if they don't have kids at that school, just in that immediate area, um, we want to give back locally, right? So think local it's part of that connection when you're looking for volunteers 
Another thing we know about volunteers is that they are in search of quality time, right? There's that elusive word time again. We're all so stretched for time. Even in quarantine times, it seems like, where am I going to fit one more thing in, right? We, have, we all have the same exact number of minutes in the course of the day that we've always had. How are we using them? Turns out that one in three adults is willing to volunteer some of that time to give back. Um, and, and it's generally coming from our parents. Somebody said that in the chat. 48% higher likelihood of parents volunteering than non-parents, right? In particular, the demographic of working mothers, right? We knew that already, sort of, didn't we, right? So working mothers are willing to volunteer because it allows them quality time with their kids. This picture is, is, is especially meaningful to me. Um, this family, um, she was Sharon, the mom, it was a cooking club volunteer for several years. I've gotten to grow up, uh, watch Abby and Victoria grow up, and we lost Sharon last year um, to, uh, um, to cancer. But it, it came on from the time that she knew that she had her tumor to the time that she passed was an incredibly shockingly short period of time. And, uh, and I will tell you, their dad has since reached out to me on trying to get these girls reconnected with 4-H because they associate that with their mother. They got to spend that quality time with her, um, not knowing that we would lose her as quickly as we did. Um, so of course, um, you know, when you think about how we spend our time teaching service to our families, you know, thinking about volunteering as a family is a powerful thing. And then who has this sense of service, right? In the chat, you guys put in a couple of folks, a couple of different age groups. Turns out, and I'm proud to say this as a Generation Xer, that we have the highest current volunteer rate among age groups at 36%. So yay, Generation X. Baby boomers, of course, have the highest number of hours that they're able to contribute because of course they're retired. Um, so that kind of makes sense. Um, but millennial volunteering is increasing more and more. And just since 2017, it's increased over 6%. Um, so when you think about your volunteer groups, or when you think about where um, to engage potential volunteers, do you have some implicit biases that are keeping you from asking because of an age group, because of some other demographic? Is it gender? Um, is it ethnicity? Is it culture, language? age, race, are any of these sort of implicit biases sort of unconsciously keeping you from, from thinking about asking for volunteers among groups, right? Um, so it's amazing to me um, how many folks don't reach out to college age kids for volunteering, right? And a lot of that has to do because they're desperate for jobs. They want jobs, right? But that volunteer experience, if you can communicate to them the skills that they're going to learn, the letters of recommendation that could potentially follow, the community connections and networking that you might be able to offer them through that volunteer experience, you'd be very surprised at what a motivator that is um, in getting them to give up their time. I rely heavily on my college kids to do like set up social media platforms for me, um, to do a data entry. Um, and um, poor Max, he's the kid in the middle here. He's since graduated from Clemson. But that summer, he, <laughs> he does not have any younger brothers and sisters. So he learned a lot. But that kid had to load and unload my van, I don't know how many times through the course of the summer. Um, so he definitely got his, uh, his workouts in doing hey, that. Hey, Patricia, can I ask a question? Yeah. Absolutely. So, yeah. So how do you engage these college kids? You say that's a vital portion of your volunteers. Mm -hmm. how, how do you reach out to these folks and uh, pull them in to get them to volunteer? Just real basic. Right. Well, it's part of the recruitment. So if you understand what the purpose of your garden is, right? If you understand why it is you have your school garden and you know what your outcomes are that you're looking for, whether it be STEM learning or health and nutrition or sensory experiences, or you're trying to grow food to give back to the community and teach service, whatever your intention or your purpose for that garden is, your why, 
If you can communicate that in a, um, in a recruitment blurb, right, then you can send that out. You can say, hey, here's an opportunity. And I send that out to um, all the career counselors at all the local tech colleges. I'll send out, you know, and it's, and I send out exactly what the kids are going to get. This is a volunteered, non-paid position, but here's what you get, right? And I list off all those things. You're going to get community networking connections. You're going to get skill building. You're going to get organization skills. You're going to get um, networking opportunities with Clemson University Extension and other soil and water and all the other folks that I'm going to talk about in a little bit as part of that community connection. Um, you know, I very clearly list out what the benefits are because I've already thought about that um, in terms of what, I, what I've just been talking about, about connecting those benefits with what motivates volunteers, right? And, and what is it on Clemson Extension letterhead or something like that? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, good question. Good question. And Patricia, I think also maybe what Ben's getting at, and I think you're going to talk about is having the framework set up. So when someone does reach out to you to become a volunteer, that it's not like a huge extra burden on you to engage them. Like you have a process, like here's a form you fill out to become a volunteer. Here's the process. Right. You have your background. We're, we're going to, we're going to get to that. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm just saying. We're going to get to that. Yep. So you guys are following, you guys are following along. We're doing planning, recruiting, orienting, supervising, evaluating. Right now we've just gotten from planning. We're talking about recruiting. Um, and, and that's the next slide. If you don't know your needs, if you don't know what it is that you need based on the purpose of your garden, then you can't communicate that effectively to all these potential community partners and stakeholders, right? So know who's in your community. I mean, there are extension and 4-H resources that are available to you already. So when you think about um, a volunteer role, um, you know, it's happened, I don't know how many times, somebody walks in and says, oh, Clemson Extension, oh, I used to be in 4-H, what do you need help with? If I don't have an answer, right, if I don't have a list of needs already identified, if I don't know exactly, because I, I don't just say, I don't know, what can you do, right? I've already lost that volunteer. So when a volunteer comes and asks me, I give them choices and I say, oh my God, I'm so glad that you asked. Here are some of the most immediate needs right now. I need soil delivered. I need, um, I need seeds packaged. I need thank you cards written. I need data entered, right? I've already got my whole list of needs ready and I can say immediately when somebody says, oh my God, how do I get involved? The first thing I'll say is, all right, well, what do you know about our organization? Why, why are you interested, right? You gotta know the why, what's their intention? What's motivating them to ask? And then I try to match up my needs and I try to give them a list. And if none of those things suit, if they're like, well, no, I don't really know that much about computers or no, I don't really, I don't have a truck so I can't deliver soil, but I can do X, Y, Z, right? So you automatically have now got a concrete example of what it is that that volunteer can contribute. There's nothing worse than having a black hole of you're at an event or you're, um, um, you got somebody walks in the office and they're like, how do I get involved? And you have nothing to share with them. You have no concrete needs that you can identify to try to match up not only with their intention behind being a volunteer, but also their skill set, what they can actually do. Patricia. Okay. Patricia, you have a, we have a question I think that's really good in the chat box. I know you're presenting, so you can't follow along with that. But um, mm -hmm. one of our participants, um, Brandy, asked, how do you reach out to those college students? Is this, you know, I'm, I'm going to extrapolate on her question. Are you making a flyer and emailing it to yeah. someone? Are you calling someone? Can you elaborate on Absolutely. that? I'm going to, and we're going to talk in a little bit about writing a volunteer description but I will write a volunteer description and it will not be a general one. It will be specific to that group, right? So if I was going to write a volunteer ex ex uh, description and, I, and I'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, if I was going to write a volunteer description, I'm going to write it specifically for my master gardener group, or I'm going to write it specifically for my college students, 
right? So I, I'm going to try to tailor that to whatever organization or group that I'm I'm recruiting from. And um, I can piggyback on that a little we'll bit, um, if you don't mind, like Brandy, when like if you would e if you emailed me and you said, hey, I'm in you know X county, like Dorchester County, and I want to reach out to college students. I would say, well, here, let me introduce you by email to Tony Bertowski at Trident Technical College, the horticulture department. I happen to know him. You could get in touch with him, share your description like Patricia's talking about and see if he can share that with his circle of students, which he has present and former students, um, to see if anybody can step forward and fill that niche. So I, is that, I hope that's answering your question and I'm going to get out of your hair. Yeah. No, that's absolutely it. And, and that's why this slide has all of these different logos up here. These were just some of the, the ones that I grabbed. I couldn't even fit all the logos on the slide of the different organizations that I network and communicate with. So it goes all the way back to what, um, you know, Ben was talking about. It, it does take a village. So when, we, when we're thinking about volunteer resources, right, there are multiple organizations that are already operating. You need to tap into that network. Um, I go up to Lowe's. I was in Lowe's um, getting things for a junior master gardener camp project. And um, I just walked up to the desk and said, hey, I need these buckets. And they've got Lowe's on them. If I take pictures of kids using these Lowe's buckets for a garden project, can, you know, what, what kind of deal can you give me? And he was like, they, they have, they have, the ability to, it doesn't have to be a formal grant. The store managers have the ability, if it's under a certain amount of money, to just give you stuff. So I just walked out of there with 12 free buckets. And I think they were priced at like $3 and change each, right? So, um, you know, it really is just, just ask. It, it can be that simple. But I connect with all of these organizations. I have, I don't know how many Eagle Scouts have come and built benches classroom style benches and gardens for us, for younger kids. Um, our Greenville County Parks and Rec has, I don't know how many 4-H clubs, um, and we partner with their um, seniors as well. Our Soil and Water Conservation District hosts a environmental science camp with me every summer. Um, our Farm Bureau, obviously, is an, is an amazing um, resource. Um, we're doing a STEM camp with Upstate Warrior Solutions, specifically for veterans' families, and their workers have been trained as my volunteers. I don't have to do it. All I did was train them and provide them the kits, and they're doing it, right? So there are, it, it's Whole Foods. Did, um, we just went in, and, we, and there's actually a whole program. They actually did a specific tour of all the different types of fruits and vegetables from all around the world at our local Whole Foods for one of our garden clubs and one of our cooking clubs, right? Free of charge. Um, all we had to do is set that up. So it really is just about saying, who is in my community? Who can I connect with? And if you have thought about the purpose of your garden, if you have a why that you can communicate effectively, if you have specific needs that you've identified, these are the areas that I really need help with, then you can communicate this to this whole network of people that are in your community that are just waiting to contribute in some way, right? Because the, the thing is, is when I go to these folks and I ask, right, that the first thing they say is, well, what do you need? And if I don't have that ready to go, I've lost an opportunity there. There's also reciprocity. So for instance, um, you know, Duke Energy gives me a lot of money to do some things. And in return, when they have public forums, I come and do a kid's program for them. So it's a reciprocity. Um, you know, uh, the Greater Greenville Master Gardeners, they're amazing. Um, and I became a member of that association just specifically to infiltrate that volunteer base. <laughs> And it was the best thing I ever could have done. Um, and it didn't really take that much more of my time. Ripper Mountain Science Center, an amazing partnership. Um, and that's part of the Greenville School District. But again, United Way, and I think we might have some United Way folks on there. They, they know about partnerships. They know how valuable that is. Um, if you can communicate what it is that your program's purpose is, and you understand what motivates people to volunteer, then you know what to ask, right? And so don't limit yourself 
um, on who to ask. Now, all of this is well and good, um, but once they do show up, let's say you've recruited it, you've got 10 people coming and they're ready to go and they are fired up and they wanna participate in your school garden, you gotta make sure that you're matching your pools of volunteers um, with proper training. Because I've done this and maybe you have before, I have been super excited to volunteer for an organization. I show up, they give me my free t-shirt, they show me where the water's, water is, and then I'm just standing around looking for direction. Nobody can tell me what to do or where to go, right? No training. Um, that's a terrible feeling, especially when you're trying to volunteer, when you're trying to uh, um, contribute. District compliance, risk management, um, really understanding how to match skills with a motivation or a purpose for why people are showing up and volunteering. So I'll give you an example. Um, over here on the left, we have beekeepers. That they are professional beekeepers. They run a beekeeping supply store in Traveler's Rest. Um, and they are consistently providing me with expertise and support. Um, now, what has happened is they are part of an association of beekeepers that now have a junior beekeeping group through Clemson Extension, right? If I had asked her to just give me stuff, right, I would have fallen short. All I would have gotten was a couple of supplies. After a while, she would have been tired. She's a business person. She would have gotten tired of giving me handouts. Every year I'm coming and asking for free stuff. That's not, that wasn't the right volunteer role for her. I recognized her skills is wanting to be an educator in the beekeeping world. She's an advocate for beekeeping techniques. She's an advocate for pollinator awareness and education. So instead of just asking her for free stuff, what I did was I connected with her purpose behind her greater organization of the Beekeepers Association. And now they give $500 in their beekeeping association dues specifically to youth programming, which is exclusively run by 4-H. Right? So that, that was a, a bigger picture ask there. That was a, um, took a little more time and a little more relationship building, but in the long run, it's going to pay off dividends than instead of just getting, you know, free chunks of wax for making candles. Right? So when you're thinking about training, I had these Boy Scouts show up. We had this environmental organization called um, uh, Friends of Joe Cassie, and we were doing a litter cleanup. And these boys showed up and they were ready to go, right? And um, they had no idea how to hang the sign. I gave them that sign. I said, the stuff's over there, it's on the table. Go and hang that sign for me. It took them 20 minutes. They were completely baffled. They didn't know what to use, even though the zip ties were sitting right beside it. They didn't know where to put it. They didn't know where to face it. You know, they were willing, but I didn't give them all the directions that they needed, right? So training is everything. Right fit. She is a water educator. She's not a wildlife person. She was doing her best to help man this table. She would have actually been way better served um, in another volunteer role. I, I mismatched her. I got her in the wrong spot. <laughs> so really understanding what your volunteer skills are is going to help you understand where that training is, right? Don't assume that your volunteers are gonna know, even though they show up and they're willing, you gotta be able to provide them with some direction and with some organization. That leads us to position descriptions, right? And it's also important not to pigeonhole your volunteers when it comes to that training piece. So let's say you have um, master gardeners show up, don't assume that all they wanna do is weed your garden for you. You know, maybe they want to lead a lesson with the kids while you go and weed the garden. So you have to be careful about pigeonholing your volunteers in specific positions. Um, again, this is a partnership. Remember the value of the time and expertise that they're bringing to your program and honor that. So you created a vision for your garden. You have connected with some of your community partners. You have a defined idea of what it is your needs are and you're asking, what about those volunteer roles? How do you form them? 
you know, this is a great um, website at the very, very bottom. Um, the top six, top six resources for nonprofits, again, comes from that point of light organization. Um, and they, you should have gotten emailed two different worksheets. One is a blank worksheet for formulating a specific volunteer position. Some of my master gardeners like to work with kids. Some of them do not. Some of them want to support me or they want to train other volunteers, adult volunteers, or they want to help go out in the community and find resources, but they don't necessarily want to work directly with the kids in the garden. And I don't know that unless I come up with my different volunteer roles and I can align the right volunteer with the right role. And how we do that is um, position descriptions. So it just takes a few minutes. You have a blank worksheet that you were emailed and then you have an example of a 4-H position description. You know, a lot of this seems, um, obvious and it seems sort of intrinsic to a lot of what you already do, but there is research that backs up these five elements. There is research that backs up that aligning purpose with community, knowing who is volunteering, recognizing the value of a volunteer, and then matching that purpose and that skill set with the right role. There's research that backs up this whole volunteer management plan. And so you're just taking, um, hopefully, you're just thinking about that it goes beyond just asking people to come and be a part of, that there's a little more thought that needs to go into on your end um, to effectively engage volunteers. My goal is to build a volunteer base that I don't have to recreate every year. It, it's, it's not sustainable for me to have to go through this process every stinking school year and get a whole new group of volunteers. I want people that are invested in my why. I want people, I've had volunteers now going on five years and they're amazing and they just keep getting better and better. And of course, you're always gonna have those that are sort of the one and done, but in the earlier poll, we talked about turnover. Um, if you put a little thought into your volunteer program ahead of time, then you're gonna have a lot less turnover in the long run. Um, and again, when, when Ben was talking about all of those grant opportunities on the federal and the state and community level, you know, is, it is absolutely acceptable in some of those grants to write in resources for volunteer recruitment and training. That's a part of a viable, sustainable program. So, um, you know, don't leave that out. Don't leave that piece out when you're asking for grant support. And obviously, you got to... You got to, once you got them, and once they're giving all of this time, um, you got to appreciate them. You got to appreciate them. How do we do that? So, I'm going to try this again. And, um, oops. Amy, I am going to send you... Um, actually, I'm going to put in the chat another link, and this time you're just going to write a phrase, um, just write a sentence. And Amy, I'm going to send you this link. How are we showing our appreciation? You've got these volunteers. You've aligned your purpose with their purpose. You've matched their skills with your needs. You're networking with your community partners. Things are happening. How do we appreciate them? How do we keep them coming back? How do we let them know how valuable they are to your program? And Amy, you want to share your screen? Hey, so this the the link you sent me just now is the same one as before. Can you just double check that for me? Should not be. Okay. Yeah, it's a Lynn is saying that she sees the old question too. 
the original, the All first right. version. All right, let me it's try it. Everybody can take a moment, take a deep breath while you work it out. <laughs> we got a lot of great questions in the chat as well. I'm, gonna, I'm trying to hurry up so I can come back to them. <laughs> you're fine. No, no, I mean, um, we're, we're handling on, um, there's no rush. Everybody's just got a lot of thoughts. People's minds are racing. All right, let's try, everybody try that link. Okay. You gonna send me the other one to share? Yeah. Yes. Got it this time. Are you ready for me to share this? Yes. Okay. Give me two. Ooh, hang on one second. Let me get over here where I can do it. Share screen. I'm going to take over. Okay. Please stand. Yeah. So, right. while everybody's filling this out, I just want to say that um, over in the chat, we had um, someone ask about how did they go about finding master gardeners. And we, we do have people here from other states. So I will say, you know, at least for Clemson, you can go on clemson.edu and, re, you know, just search for um, Master Gardeners and find your county. Or you can email me or chat me over here, and I'll see if I can't connect you at least by email to your person. I will say that right now Master Gardeners are a little thin on the ground in terms of being able to get out and do things because of COVID, but I know they are dying to get back to work. So, um, lot of cake. Yes. <laughs> Mini tokens. Yes. <gasps> oh. Can I just make a personal thing and just say that, um, for the master gardeners that I've worked with in conjunction with school garden projects, that the most successful thank you thing that I've, or gift I've ever seen someone give is just the kids writing a thank you note and illustrating it with the precious little artwork. It's just, I mean, if you want to make a 65 year old man melt, just give him some artwork from a kid or her. It's amazing. All right, these are some really good ideas. I'm going to refresh yeah. it one more time just to see if anything else is popping up. I love how it's scrolling on its own. Yeah. It's interesting. Cool. Right. Yeah, I love that. Honorary degree. Yeah. I want an honorary degree. I know, right? Volunteer parties or outings. Yes. Share the profit. Yes. Lots of food. <laughs> Gift cards. Everyone does. Yeah, it's funny. Hard. It's funny though. I, I don't know what is the worst volunteer gift in the world, right? That should be another question. And, and it's like, um, what if one of your volunteers is a diabetic and you give them a box of candy, right? It's like, it's no, like it's the thought that counts. <laughs> well, <laughs> it to some degrees, but there is, um, there is some uh, um, thoughtfulness that needs to go into how we show appreciation. So, so if we our mutual friend Brandy Moss just had a Zoom meeting with her um, school this morning and has uh -huh. given the devastating news that there will be no clubs for the school year. And I told her oh. we kind of wait to the end, but you know, she asked another yeah. question, we'll question just now like, what if the school won't allow visitors? Um, in terms of the volunteers. So we know we're like in these weird times. Do you have any thoughts on that? I'll let you. Yeah, so we're gonna end with sort of a, what does all of this look like in COVID times, right? Um, so I'm almost done. We're wrapping it up. Um, so let's, let's focus on appreciation real quick before we get off track. Um, part of the, um, language of appreciation, right? It's important to know because there's nothing worse than giving the wrong thank you um, or the wrong show of appreciation. I mean, 
you know, yes, free stuff, food is great. But if you've taken time, um, if you really value your volunteers and you've taken the time um, to match the right volunteer with the right position, you've taken a little bit of time to um, connect with your community resources, right? You've taken a little bit of time to form the purpose behind your garden. Then you're gonna also need to take the time to understand your volunteers' love language, for lack of a better word. So we all know words of affirmation, quality time, acts of service, tangible gifts, physical touch, right? That applies for volunteers as well. You know, some volunteers are devast or just, they can't imagine a more uncomfortable thing than to be paraded out in front of a room full of people and given an award and accolades. Like it's, it's, that's not why they're volunteering. They're a deer in the headlights. They're terrified. They're like, oh no, I don't want a lot of attention drawn to me. I just want to quietly do my acts of service. So maybe that volunteer just wants to go out after uh, work and have a cup of coffee or just get a, maybe get a Starbucks gift card for a cup of coffee. Or maybe that's the volunteer that wants the handwritten cards, right? When you're dealing with organizations and you're trying to thank individuals versus organizations, you need to be a little more thoughtful about that. Because organizations love to be, um, they love to be shouted out. So if you have any sort of social media or any sort of newsletter, remember I told you about the kids with all the Lowe's buckets? I took pictures of those kids with their Lowe's buckets. I sent it in a, I had them all sign the card and I sent the picture to the manager, but then I also followed up with uh, an email to the immediate supervisor and told that supervisor what an amazing gift that, you know, what amazing decision that manager made. So now every time I go in that store, if that manager sees me, he's like, hey, you made me look good in front of my boss. What do you need today? Right? So you really need to be thoughtful about um, how you're showing appreciation because that then feeds back into that loop of, um, reciprocity in why somebody's volunteering in the first place, right? I don't volunteer as much as I love them and I do love them. I'm not volunteering for the cupcakes, I'm not even really volunteering for the gift cards. But if you put my picture on, this is just for me, but if you put my picture on your site and you tag me in it, I can put that in my evaluation, right? I can, I can use that to promote my program even further to say, look at what your, your, your friendly 4-H agent um, was a um, kayak safety boater at an Ironman event this past weekend, right? And there's a picture of me in my boat or whatever it is. So, you know, really taking the time to understand what your um, volunteers sort of language of appreciation is, is going to go a long way. Volunteers make the best recruiters for more volunteers. So, you know, think of, um, I'm gonna give yourself some homework. Think of three ways um, that you can thank volunteers, three more meaningful ways that you can thank volunteers um, maybe than what you've already was doing. And that list that we just looked at was a, was a really good start. All right, last but not least, um, Nobody likes to do this, um, but that's not true. Some of us really geek out on it, but it, it is essential and it does not have to be formal. You're gonna get an evaluation at the end of this webinar, right? Um, and when I do camps, we start our day at camp with what did you learn yesterday? What do you wanna learn today, right? That is an informal evaluation. So um, there are, um, evaluation data is gonna provide you the information that you need to help you make decisions that are gonna help facilitate better communication, they're gonna help you continuously improve, um, and they're gonna help you um, be able to communicate to volunteers more effectively, and you're gonna be able to utilize your volunteers more effectively. Um, so don't leave this piece out. There are three sort of main um, evaluation types, which is, is it process-oriented, goal-oriented, or outcome-oriented? Um, and just taking the time to answer some of these questions for yourself and your garden program is going to go a long way in helping you to fulfill your vision. Remember, we started with defining your purpose, why you have a garden in the first place. Well, how are you doing now, right? Um, and this is kind of where we can talk about how is all this going to look post-COVID? 
Well, I don't think there is going to be a post COVID. How's this all going to look in current COVID? Um, you know, what kind of training needs are volunteers going to need? You know, the whole idea of going into schools is going to completely change, I believe. Um, I don't even know as a, as a, an educator uh, that's invited to do school programming and to do after school programming, I don't even know what that looks like yet. I know in Greenville County District, I had to go through, there's a, a tiered volunteer approach. You're, you can be a volunteer type one or a volunteer type two. Um, and I don't know what that's going to look like and how I'm going to, what kind of access I'm going to be afforded um, in the fall. Um, so how do we need to communicate the, the training protocols um, for your garden? How are your needs going to change, right? We talked about when you're forming your garden purpose and understanding why you're gardening, how does that change now given the circumstances? Um, how about, you know, is your community network going to rely less on individual volunteers and more on those community connections, right? There's pools of people. There are even companies that pay their employees volunteer time hours. For instance, Amy had a great partnership with Molina Healthcare, and there's some, they're, they paid their employees to deliver garden transplants across the county to her different schools. Um, so, um, you know, that was a very specific service that just didn't, you know, just required them picking up the plants and dropping it off at the front of the school office. You know, um, it probably varies from store to store, but Cole's department stores also has a employee volunteer program. Right, right. A lot of those organizations do. And I think that that some of that is going to um, is going to be I think I'm going to end up relying more heavily on my community connections um, than I am with my um, with some of my individual volunteers. Although, you know, I had to provide a whole new set of training for my club leaders and volunteers because we, when we moved some of our programming to virtual, um, Clemson University came up with this whole new list of um, protocols that we had to follow that I had to give to my volunteers. I have to register programs as virtual now. I have to make sure my volunteers are getting um, um, liability and photo media release forms signed before they meet with their kids online to make sure that that you know so there's a lot of things that change um, and I've got to be able to adapt and provide my volunteers that kind of training and those resources so that I'm not um, I don't chase them away it, it, in some instances we can make it so difficult for people to volunteer that they're like well why bother so it's my job as the volunteer manager as the program manager to make it as easy as possible to do all of that footwork to ensure that that burden doesn't fall on the volunteer. Um, all right, so uh, again, like I said at the very beginning, you know, these five core elements of volunteer management can be you literally, I mean, there are some people that make careers out of this. We just did a crash course we touched on what I thought was um, sort of the philosophy, hopefully, to get you thinking about your volunteers and how you value them, how you communicate with them, um, and how you might utilize them a little bit differently, um, and, and how important it is to include them in the planning of your school garden program um, and not just as an afterthought um, or not just as something that you need out of desperation. Um, but go ahead and, and incorporate them into that purpose of your garden from the get-go. Um, and then providing them, you've got those volunteer, those position worksheets, you know, spend a little bit of time thinking about what are your needs? Do you need um, a parent to go out to the community and, um, and ask for soil or ask for garden tools or ask for garden gloves? Do you need, do you have a parent or a volunteer that is a go-getter that will go around and ask people for things? Do you have a volunteer that likes to work on a newsletter that can get out a newsletter about your garden program to generate some buzz there? Do you need to formulate some more specific volunteer descriptions that then you can send out to things like local community colleges or Boy Scout groups or Sertoma clubs? Um, you know, so identify your needs list know what the purpose of your garden is. Don't be afraid to ask non-traditional groups 
in your head, you might have just thought retirees are the only people that volunteer, but that's not true. We know that. Um, and um, make sure that you're providing them with all of the training and all the resources they're going to need um, so that their pathway to volunteering for you is as easy as possible. You know, be a little bit organized, be a little bit intentional about your program, and that will go a long way. And then lastly, of course, just um, know what that volunteer is really going to feel appreciated by, right? It's not everybody, not everybody has the same appreciation language. So take a little time about that. And then evaluate all of this. Is it working for you? Um, what, where do you need to improve? Where do you need help with? Um, so I hope that you got something out of this and I'd like to catch up on questions. Amy, if you can help me with that. Yeah, and um, Lynn, I can, I mean, I can turn on, you know, for individual folks, I can turn on, um, you know, your microphone if you have a specific question, and I'm happy to do that, um, but I can just also relay